Here's a calculation that you might have come across, herd immunity. Let's suppose we have a person with a disease and the disease has R number 4, meaning each infected person will infect 4 people on average during the course of their infection. Now let's change the story and assume that some fraction of the population is either vaccinated or immune because they've already recovered from the disease. Then out of the 4 that would have been infected, only one actually does get infected. Okay, this is the basic calculation behind herd immunity. It says that for our disease to stop spreading, we need this value, r times 1 minus q, to be less than 1. But this leaves some questions unanswered, like if this disease is going to be endemic, then what sort of prevalence might we expect? The simple herd immunity calculation doesn't have anything to say about total numbers infected. To answer questions about prevalence, we want a model with state space. Previously, we've thought about a model with just two types of people, infected and susceptible. Now let me throw a few more into the mix. Let's count the number of recovered people, the number of vaccinated people, and I'll split the susceptible pool into anti-vaxxers and others who just haven't got around to being vaccinated yet. Now, we can imagine inventing a Markov chain model to describe this system. It will have a five-dimensional state space counting the number of people in each subgroup. But this sort of model very quickly becomes unwieldy and it will be a great big nasty calculation to find the equilibrium distribution and the answer will be a computational answer. It won't be terribly illuminating compared to an equation answer. So what we're going to talk about in this video is a crude back of the envelope way to do calculations about Markov chains. It's not going to give us exact answers but it's really easy and it gives a rough idea of how the Markov chain is likely to behave. This back of the envelope calculation is called drift modeling. It's easiest to see how it works by going through an example. Here is our active users model, which we've looked at a few times already. The state xn is the number of users of an online platform at time n, and we're modeling its transitions by this equation here. And this is the sort of behavior we saw. Fluctuations in the number of active users but with a stationary distribution. Now, let's forget about all the precise details of the stationary distribution and let's just look at the peak. The peak somewhere around 17 users. How could we estimate this number 17 with a simple back of the envelope calculation? Here's the idea. First, we'll calculate what's called the drift this is defined to be the expected change in xn over one time step, and it's a function of the current state. Here we've written it as drift delta of little x, where x is the current state. For this model, it's easy to work out the drift. We just have to look up the expected values of these random variables on Wikipedia. Next, I'm going to sketch a diagram called the drift diagram. This has time n on the horizontal axis and current state x on the vertical axis. And I want to mark on this diagram what the drift is at every possible state x. So first I'll figure out the x value at which drift is zero. Well, let's call it x hat. For this drift formula here, x hat is lambda times d. Any x larger than this, we have negative drift. And any x smaller than this, we have positive drift and I'm going to draw on arrows pointing in the direction of drift. I'll just repeat the arrows at all time steps n. These arrows show how big I can expect my next jump to be. If I'm in a state where x is very small, then I'll expect a big jump up next time step. If I'm in a state where x is very large, then I'll expect a big jump down, and so on. Next, here's what's called the drift model. This is simply a deterministic recurrence relation, like the Markov chain, but with the random updates replaced by their expected values. In other words, updating the state each time step according to the drift. We can plot this drift model on the diagram, which is some arbitrary initial state x0, and then solve the deterministic recurrence. And in this case, it'll just head towards the state x hat, the state where the drift is zero, and it'll stay there. This state is called the fixed point. So, what does all this have to do with the Markov chain? 
Well, when we run the Markov chain, it's going to follow the drift on average. If we're in a state where xn is small, for example, the drift is large positive, so we expect xn plus 1 to be much larger. So intuitively, these arrows and the fixed point give us a rough back of the envelope idea of how the Markov chain is likely to evolve. There are theorems that one can prove here, limit theorems, about exactly how close the Markov chain's trajectories are likely to be to the drift model, and I'll mention them briefly at the end of this video. But first, let's try out drift modeling on another example. Here's the simple epidemic model that we looked at earlier this week. Pause the video and see if you, you can figure out the drift and sketch the drift diagram and draw on the typical solution to the drift model. When you're ready, press play. This is what we'd expect. For this problem, if r is larger than 1, then the drift is always positive, and if r is less than 1, then it's always negative, and here this picture is for r larger than 1. Actually, what I said isn't quite correct. Even if r is larger than 1, there is still a fixed point x hat equals 0, meaning if we're in a state with 0 people infected, then we'll just stay there. But, in general, the drift model recurrence has a simple solution, exponential growth, and here you can see the formula for the growth rate. Remember, this drift diagram is just a rough back of the envelope picture. Even if r is larger than 1, it's still possible that there'll be random fluctuations that bring the number of infected cases down to zero, and then the Markov chain will get stuck there in state zero forever. The drift diagram tells us about typical trajectories, not about distributions. But it's great to be able to just work out, for example, the exponential growth rate with crude, simple back-of-the-envelope calculations like this. OK, so that's all there is to drift modelling. As I said, it's a crude, easy, back-of-the-envelope way to get out quick answers, and sometimes that's all we want. Let's just finish by going back to our detailed epidemic model. And let's see what we can learn from drift analysis. First, we need to say what the Markov chain actually is. In other words, we need to say what its transitions are. There are lots of arrows in this diagram showing everything that can happen to all the different subgroups. Let's just pick out one of the updates. Let's say the number of anti-vaxxers who become infected. I've proposed a distribution for the number of anti-vaxxers who get infected each time step, this Poisson distribution here. The only difference between this distribution and what we considered earlier in our simple model, Poisson of r times i n divided by d, is that I've stuck in a factor a n divided by n, where capital N is the total population size. This says, I'd expect a total number r times i n divided by d new infections, and a fraction a n divided by big N of them will be from subgroup A, since that subgroup makes up a n divided by big N of the total population. And how about this transition for vaccinated people to become infected? I put in an extra factor 1 minus p sub v. The idea is that vaccination gives protection against infection. I think AstraZeneca jab is around 80% effective, so we'd only expect 20% of potential infections to actually turn into real infections. So PV in this expression is the protection level for the vaccine. This might seem like an awful lot to put together, this Markov chain model, but it's a really valuable skill to become versatile enough at modelling to be able to throw something like this together and to glean from whatever news articles you can what the constants should be. This is a skill that Natsuki's, especially physicists, are really great at, and it's why they're so sought after for modelling work. Mathwise get stuck in pointless details about, oh, but this model doesn't account for the correlation that we'd expect to see, and Komsky's get sidetracked into, hey, I could write a programming language to make this sort of modelling easier, and they never even end up answering the question. Anyway, we can run this Markov chain, and here is a typical output. I'm showing the population breakdown into each of these five groups in a very small population of size 100. And here's a simulation run in a larger population. This difference Random fluctuations in small systems, everything smoothed out for large systems, that's actually the whole point of drift models. 
Drift models tell us approximately how a Markov chain will behave, and the approximation gets better the bigger the system is. You've learnt about the law of large numbers for averages of random variables. Well, drift models are the law of large numbers for random processors. And this is where differential equations come from. Differential equations are the limit of Markov chains in the limit where the drift each time step is predictable in the sense that its standard deviation is small relative to its mean. But Markov chains are richer than differential equations because they can capture phenomena that are quintessentially random. In the top picture, the one with population 100, the end state isn't quite the same as in the bottom picture. That's because the epidemic is being driven by the number of infected people and, when that number is very small, then the drift can be very large. For example, a jump from one infected to three infected is an increase of 200%. So when we want to model systems that end up being controlled by things that are quintessentially random, Markov chains are the way to go and will leave the differential equations to the physicists.